today, May May fourteenth, uh, two thousand twenty-two. Uh, this is the May Free, Columbus Free Press Salon. Uh, thanks for coming on. We're, it, we're doing our International Workers uh, Day celebration uh, by looking at local organizing efforts uh, in Central Ohio area. Uh, we on on tonight. We're going to have several folks talking about the local. Uh, organizing at the Starbucks uh, stores. We have two stores that are trying to organize here in town. Uh, then we also uh, have some OSU uh, student and employees that are um, trying to organize, uh, continually trying to organize uh, and have had some good progress. So we're gonna uh, talk that a little bit. And then we have um, possibly some updates on the Amazon organizing and then uh, a little bit about the uh, local uh, unions in the city, uh, what they had to do to get, get some stuff pushed through this uh, labor friendly, uh, so-called labor friendly um, society uh, or mayor uh, administration that we have here, uh, so-called labor friendly. And then um, wanted to make some announcements. At the end, near the end, um, well, after we've sort of gone through some of the formal presentations, we also have Seaborg um, coming on uh, to, to do a little bit of update. Bill, Bill's going to update us on some of the Charter Review, the Charter Commission's uh, review, the Charter Review Commission um, that is in place to look at how are we uh, looking to change um, or how the city is looking to change uh, City Council's uh, structure and other aspects of uh, in, in, in city input, uh, civilian input. Um, Chuck's coming on. So um, let's see, do we have some of the Starbucks folks here yet? I don't see names that I'm recognizing. So anybody Starbucking? We might go, Anthony, if you're ready, we might jump to you first, but let, we're going to hold off for two seconds. Get everybody still coming in a little bit. Um, but wanted to really update everybody with local organizing that's going on in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that's why we wanted to focus on that. Um, and then we also may have Jessica and some other uh, folks that uh, helped organize the big rally today uh, about um, healthcare access, uh, particularly about the, the, the present threat on abortion and women's rights to access of healthcare. But we may not get to that uh, today if sunk it on but it was a great action people went down to the state house and did a few things all right yeah so just remember we are live 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 uh on facebook and others so please just, uh, try to remember um john do you want to sort of introduce the uh starbucks uh campaign i know you wrote an article and then if not we'll we'll jump to ohio state first john lasker anybody John, is he just, is he on yet? Not the song. It was T Taylor Dorrell that wrote the articles. I don't see him on here. Okay. Do we have any of the local uh, Starbucks organizers yet? Because they were emphasizing they needed to get off, get on and get off. If not, let's go with Anthony, okay? Anthony, you ready to start with uh, some update for the Ohio State uh, University uh, student employee organizing? Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Um, I apologize for not having my camera on. It, my Zoom is unable to detect my camera. Um, I guess this just likes to happen sometimes. But um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for um, inviting me to this. Um, this is the first time I've attended a Columbus Free Press salon. Um, but uh, I see some familiar faces here. Um, it's really nice to be with you all. Um, I want to thank Mark for... Um, supporting our organizing efforts um as well as thank the free press for writing about our organizing efforts earlier this year um so yeah so basically i'm a former ohio state employee and student i just graduated um this month but um we basically this semester and last semester um the student workers at ohio state did a lot of organizing for um higher wages better benefits and uh reform to um, the system of uh, international student employment. 
And we've definitely seen a lot of progress. Um, we've seen a lot of engagement among the student body. Um, this is obviously a very popular issue among college students and college student workers. Um, if you look at like polling, a, a vast majority of college students support a $15 minimum wage and obviously, um, you know, other benefits that would come with more representation for workers as well. Um, so it, it wasn't necessarily difficult to um, engage college students when we were, we were building up, you know, our support. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there too, that, that young people are very much ready to take up, <laughs> take a stand for what they deserve and, and what's being taken away from them right now. Um, but yeah, so I'll just give a little, I actually see someone just shared I think some pictures from a protest that we held. Um, thank yeah. you to whoever's doing that. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So that that actually that's um, a picture from the protest we held in January of this year, 2022. That that was basically the the formal like launch of our campaign for Student Workers United. Um, and basically, just before this, in like October, November, December of last year, was just a lot of the initial groundwork for a workers campaign i hesitate to say union because as of right now like um university employees at a public university like ohio state we're actually not allowed to unionize like by law we would have to challenge either a state or national you know ruling um to allow public student workers to unionize um a lot of that has to do with federal work study laws as well um, but, you know, regardless, we, we still organize, you know, we're not going to let that kind of stuff stop us from organizing. Um, so, yeah, so basically before, before this protest happened and before our campaign officially launched, we basically just went around campus, um, talking to a lot of different student workers, handing out literature, putting up flyers with QR codes for workers to spot on their, on their way to work or on their way home from a closing shift, um, basically like putting out different messages, like, hey, did you know that OSU has this many $4 billion in uh, unrestricted net assets that they've collected over the years? Why don't they put that money towards student workers? Or, hey, did you know that President Christina Johnson is, is being paid over a million dollars a year and her salary bonus alone could have led to um, a pay increase for nearly 100 workers? Um, and just kind of putting, putting stuff out there um, on a university the students are already kind of fed up against the management and against the uh, university administration for various issues. Um, and, you know, over, I want to say around a, a quarter or a third of the student population is employed with the university. So it's not, again, it's not hard to find people that related to this. Um, we basically put out a petition calling for a $15 minimum wage, um, more higher and, and frequent wage increases on top of that, understanding that 15 is really just the minimum nowadays. Um, we also also called for free campus park for student workers. Um, if any of you have ever had the discomfort of driving to Ohio State campus and having a and you know that it's um, very expensive. Um, it didn't used to be like that either. Um, the, the, camp, uh, the parking was actually sold out to a private company several years ago, um, which shot up the, the parking rates for students and, and um, really anybody who uses the parking garages. So what will happen is you'll have people, students or non-student employees going to work on campus and having to pay, you know, X amount from their paycheck just to park, just to be able to go to their job. Um, and not, not all jobs actually offer a parking discount. Um, I remember actually talking to someone who works in transportation at OSU who works with the buses and they had to, they had to drive, um, at their night shift at like midnight to this random like parking facility in some off-campus area just to like work on buses that were being kept there overnight and he still had to pay for parking because he couldn't park for anywhere else um, and that was taking money out of his paycheck so definitely that was a big demand that um, that actually helped engage with a lot of non-student workers as well because actually not a lot of student workers have cars. So, you know, they kind of just walk from their dorm to their job, but a lot of non-student workers deal with commuting and deal with the high parking prices. Um, and the other thing that we put on our petition list was uh, sick leave and holiday pay, two things that they don't give us right now, as well as um, 
higher work hour limits for international students and DACA students. Um, basically, right now that we were asking the university to advocate for that as an at a national level. It's not something they can legally change the university policy, but international students and students that are here um, through DACA, um, they can only work a certain hour limit. I believe international students right now it's 20 and for DACA students it's 10. Still have students that need to work here who've immigrated and they can't afford to pay for their education because they can only work 10 or 20 hours a week. Um, and you know they're they're taking part time classes so that they can work more, um, but they they still even then can't save up enough to afford um, tuition, housing costs, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we saw a lot of success with that petition. It got a lot of broad support across campus. I believe we have almost a thousand signatures now. That led to the development of what is on screen now that Mark is sharing on the Student Workers United group and campaign, which now has over. 200 and over 200 active members. Um, we had a lot of success recruiting these last couple of months and we're excited to bring that energy um, into the next semester after this summer. Um, and then last but not least, now that I've told you about how we started the campaign and what our organizing strategy was, I'll tell you a bit about what we were able to get accomplished this semester. Um, so unfortunately, none of our demands were actually implemented this semester. Um, but as we understand, as labor organizers, you know, administration likes to stall. They like to give you small concessions to keep you satisfied. But, you know, we're still keeping up the fight. Um, but we are happy for what we did win this semester. There were, as far as we know of, three departmental um, wage increases. The first and most notable one was in dining, um, which is where we were told to focus a lot of our efforts on because that's where the university tends to face the most labor shortages. Um, it's also a very essential part of the university. Um, you know, students have to be fed in order to keep on going with their studies, right? So as dining workers, I was a dining worker, um, we're very valuable to the university and a lot of dining workers understand that. So we were actually able to win a $2 wage increase um, and pressuring the university to continue to extend those wage increases to other parts of the university, not just the Office of Dining Services, um, and we believe that the university will continue with that pattern, but our job as organizers obviously is to make them do it quicker and make sure that all students get rate wage increases, all workers at the university get wage increases. Um, so, but we were actually able to win a $2 wage increase for dining, as well as wage increases for other student employees at the Ohio Union um, and the events um, workers as well as math tutors actually are getting a raise in the fall. Um, so we believe that's a result of the pressure that we've been putting on the university by spreading this message through local news, by spreading this message to parents of student workers, to alumni, um, basically making the university look foolish for paying us so little. Um, another really shady thing that the university does is they actually pay temp workers um, much higher minimum wage rates compared to student workers. Like, people will get paid 18 an hour, 22 an hour, which is fantastic, right? That's what people should be getting paid, but they're doing the same jobs as us student workers, just as temp workers instead, which goes to show that the university could pay us more if they wanted to, they're just simply choosing not to. Um, and instead they're doing business with these other companies. Um, so there's been a lot of things like that, little things I think in, in different um, places where students work that have kind of been building up over the years and have led to a lot of frustration and overall um, eagerness to change something about the employment and working conditions and relations between the student workers and the university overall. Um, we actually saw a $15 minimum wage get voted on by the student body in 2018, but it was shot down by the Board of Trustees. Um, so we've also been doing some internal organizing to try to build up that internal pressure at OSU as well to give them some some hard deadlines that they have to adhere to so they can't just you know brush us off in negotiations um so the last victory that we were able to get through our organizing we actually got all five of our demands the wage increase the benefits holiday pay sick pay international students all of that was voted on unanimously by the undergraduate student government as well as the Council on Student Affairs, which is a subcommittee of the University Senate. 
Um, and so now we have that voted on twice, um, you know, in the university's records. It'll be going to the Senate in the September of this year, where the president, as well as other stake, major stakeholders, will have to basically it'll force the vote on that. Um, so we're very, very excited about what we were able to accomplish this semester and what we know we'll be able to accomplish in the future, so long as students and workers continue to organize, continue to stay militant, um, and continue to raise awareness about what is going on, not just at Ohio State, but across the country when it comes to young people who are in a very particular situation, being in debt by thousands of dollars to these major institutions and being exploited through their labor, through low wages. Um, we see what happens when people realize just how much they're being screwed when they come together and use collective action like this. Um, even if we're not allowed to unionize right now, I fully believe that if student workers continue to show each other that they have collective power when they come together, we can and will change these laws that prevent us from unionizing. Um, so I was honored to work on this campaign as my time as an Ohio State student. Um, now I'm unemployed and I need a job in the labor movement. Um, so if anybody is looking to hire, um, please, I'll, I'll put my email in the in the Zoom chat. But I'm, I'm really proud of what the student workers were able to accomplish through this campaign. I'll definitely be, you know, advising um, as students continue to organize in the fall. And if any of you would like to get plugged in with the campaign, I'm, I'm definitely happy to send some contact info uh, for that. But yeah, that's basically my unfiltered, unscripted description of how we organized this campaign over the past eight months. So yeah, again, thank you for the platform and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has either from here or from the Facebook or anything like that. Thank, thank you, thank you, Anthony. Uh, your leadership has been very strong as well as just the collective uh, leadership that you have put together there is very dynamic. Um, let's hold off on some questions. We, um, Anthony, can you stay around a little bit? Oh yeah, I'll be here for the okay. whole thing, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Damon and Ben are on, they're star local Starbucks organizers. They have to get on and get off, so let them go and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what does it mean to be uh, organizing a non-union shop right now. OSU is not a non-union shop, but as Anthony alluded to, the, the collective bargaining law in Ohio sculpted out student employees specifically that they do not have the right to organize uh, based on the collective bargaining 4713 uh, the, in the Constitution of Ohio. Uh, so it is something that we'd have to change laws if Ohio State. Now it doesn't say they're not allowed to. It just says they're not. They don't have the 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 obligation. There's not an obligation to recognize. So if Ohio State would all of a sudden recognize uh, that right, uh, then it would be a whole different thing. It's because Michigan is is you know Michigan University employees and other stuff. So so uh, thank you, Anthony. Just hang on for a little bit. We'll do some more questioning and talking with you. But Damon, you jumped on. So you and Ben, I didn't see Ben. Is he with you per, uh, personally or is he separately signed on? I, I don't know. Uh, ben ahead. actually has something. He had something come up. So it's okay, just going to Go ahead, Damon, there. please. Thank um, you. Yeah, so yeah. Talk a little bit about what, what you're doing, where you're at in the organizing process in Columbus. And uh, thank you for doing your work, man. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, right now, we are actually uh, just about to wrap up the last of our ballots. Um, so our election date will be live counted on May 24th. So it's coming up really soon. Can you back up just a little bit? Okay, sure. you got cards together. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that process? Because I don't know if uh, I don't know if everyone on here has really gone through a, a union organizing. Okay. And, and okay. Okay. Effort, so, and that's a lot of work. So please. It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, when we started, um, we actually had to get in contact with um, kind of like, you know, Ground Zero where uh, Buffalo was, where they actually reached out to uh, Workers United to kind of get some representative, you know, feedback and everything started. So we got in contact with them and thus get in contact basically directly with Workers United um, as our chosen um, union organization to go through. Um, from there, we were assigned a rep for a region. Um, and he had been helping us the entire time with kind of laying down the guidance of, uh, okay, so we need to get some cards started. This is why this is important. Um, you know, this is your first step toward, um, 
even just getting some legal grounding for if, as if you know, if, for example, with me, if Starbucks were to, um, if Starbucks were to, you know, retaliate, um, you know, they, you know, or, you know, fire anyone or do any sort of, um, you know, so like disciplinary action, uh, you know, of their own, you know, imagination, um, we could say like, well, I signed a card and they knew that. So this could be our first step saying that like, no, like we, like they knew I was, I had, um, you know, signed a card that I was in favor of unionizing. Therefore, that gives you some legal grounding um, to say that this is retaliation. So that is a super important um, step to to go through. And we had some hard time with that um, at first with our entire team because there was that that really big fear of like, oh, I don't want to put my name on anything. Um, but one thing we did learn was that that your name is not shared with your employer. Um, so and that was re that really helped with the anxiety of everyone. Because they thought like, well, if they send this to Starbucks and then they, you know, they might be mean to me and they, you know, I might, it might jeopardize some things I'm going to do in the future. Um, but as soon as they're like, no, it's only given to the, the, the National Labor Board just to show that, hey, this certain percentile duh, is in favor of unionizing the store. Um, and so once we got that through for us with Workers United to back us, they won 70% um, of our workers. Uh, so once we got that, um, which took a lot, really, that was like the longest time it really took. Because once we got actually filed, everything really just seemed to speeding up. Um, what was the hardest part was probably just educating myself and all the other organizers. Jesse and Ben were also the organizers for our, uh, our store um, to educate ourselves, take it upon ourselves to you know put time and labor into educating ourselves and learning more about unions because none of us had been in a union job um, at all. Um, and so, you know, like, okay, let's look at the history, um, even the history of Workers United and um, seeing, you know, being among more peers and not just more Starbucks peers, um, but also just, you know, peers who have been in unions uh, job before or um, are currently in union jobs. So that also really helped when we reached out to um, our local unions um, for any sort of mentorship or guidance in general um, for especially when everything started getting scary after we um, after we filed. So the union cards, super, super important. First like ground step to make sure that you are legally protected. Um, so I, even after we filed, we still had some partners. Oh, that's what we called, um, you know, our crew is partners. Um, that did not file. And it wasn't until uh, Senator Sherrod Brown came, he asked, he like really referred to that. He's like, he's like you know, is everyone signed? And we're like, well, we, there's a couple that, that still have it. He's like, make sure they get signed. And so we, I went back and I talked to them like saying like, hey, like you guys are, you know, at that point had really turned tides and became pro union. Um, we said like, hey, you should definitely do this because this is the, the, the base thing you got to do. And so they, I sent them the link again um, which is just a link that you just digitally sign. And um, and that was pretty much the easiest part once you everyone was really on board with it. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Damon. Mm -hmm. So so you described that part. So now you say you're at the 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 level of 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 final count of the cards and moving towards the next step and sort of describe that now. Um so yes, yeah, so we got the, the count of the cards. We had, I think. 69%, 70%. Um, and so our representative took that to the National Labor Board saying like, hey, you know, on Monday, we're going to officially file like eight o'clock in the morning. And so that was, and so we had to write a letter to the CEO, which is now um, the old founder, Howard Schultz, um, and then someone to our store manager um, and someone to the press. Um, and so really like the, the press coverage was one of like the most helpful things you can do because you want people to engage with you on this stuff and that really just starts bringing out especially supporters and that's really what we um started experiencing right away after we filed it was you know very scary because we knew that you know our store manager was not going to really understand at first at least um the district manager and whatnot they were not going to be happy about it because of how starbucks as a company had reacted um previously to other unionizing efforts um so in that point we had to remember our training essentially with um, you know the, the presentations and stuff about what to expect 
uh, historically how Starbucks has been reacting, but also just other historical anti-union campaigns. Um, and the best advice that we got was to simply hold together as much as possible um, and just really support each other, kind of just how unionizing works. Just like, you know, you are workers who are working for each other, who are trying to protect each other. So whenever, you know, it got, you know, pretty scary or people started getting, you know, pulled aside for, you know, one of these things called one-on-ones, which is essentially just a blanketed term for union busting um, and confronting them on any sort of, you know, like perhaps fear um, that they might have um, to, you know, really check in with them and make sure like, hey, you know, you know, is there any sort of, well, the first thing is like unlawful practices. Like, did they say that you can't unionize? Did they give you any bribery? Did they play on any fears or any like emotional manipulation? Because all that stuff is, um, is uh, what's called uh, unlawful practices. Um, and so we have definitely seen Starbucks do that before. I um, mean, plenty of places have do it. I mean, it's kind of one of the really big tactics is um, it's called uh, fears, tears, smears, and bribery are the four big ones. Um, so, you know, they'll, they'll emotional warfare, you know, just fear warfare, um, you know, just, you know, the smearing part is just saying like, you know, talking down about unions, trying to find some dirt on any sort of unionized uh, organization. In our, in, you know, in my case, uh, Work is United to kind of say like, well, they just want your dues, you know, they're not really for you. Um, you know, bribery is essentially like, well, you know, if you think, you know, what one uh, barista was told is like, well, you know, if you really show that you're in favor of, you know, the company, then uh, you know, th there might be a higher position for you in the future, you know, kind of stuff like that. Promising that uh, you're going to be the, the next CEO if you don't join. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, you know, um, we'll give you something real nice. One of our longtime friends, Mimi, has a question. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to take questions now or if you want to work through your whole presentation. How do you want to do that? I would you okay? I can take a question now. Yeah. Okay, Mimi, go ahead, please. You got to unmute. It, it, I know. It's actually better for the end of it. I'm sorry. I was just okay. getting in okay. line. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> All right. We'll get you. We'll get you. All right. I won't forget you. <laughs> All right, so, Damon, so you're you're at this point. You you mentioned training. You sort of fluff off the training. I, I not not fluff it off, but you don't really talk it much about. Can you describe that kind of? You know that that the, the the companies want to do this fake one on ones, but the one on ones are very important at the very beginning when you're talking about organizing a union. You do like you talk to people. What are what are your challenges? What are your what are your concerns? What are your challenges? What would you join me at a next meeting? Kind of questions. What kind of discussion? What what where? Just just start talking about how this all started. What what where where did it come from? You, I mean, I know it's going on around the country right now, mm. and you guys wanted to be part of the the gang. No, I'm I'm kidding. But. <laughs> the, the, it, what 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 brought it what what brought you to this point because it's very important i think that um you got to have some kind of energy behind it mm -hmm. uh, absolutely it's not just mad anger mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be some kind of good anger it has to be some kind of stuff that's moving forward so please if you don't mind yeah absolutely um i think for for my store particularly we um a few of us who had been working um for a long time with the company like myself i've been working for the company for It'll be nine years and the end of August. Okay. Um, and so it's, you know, it's been a very long time. And I've been seeing a lot of things. I've experienced a lot of things. I've bounced a couple of stores. Um, it really took the, pan the beginning of the pandemic where, you know, things were not, even before, actually, let, let me even go further um, back. You know, even before the pandemic hit, which exacerbated everything, of course, uh, you know, we were talking a lot about how, you know, the, the inflation of living, um, just the more work that's continuously being added um, while not also getting, you know, an inflated raise or like, you know, or um, there, there was always no, this inequity between um, wages of supervisors, baristas, but also senior supervisors and senior baristas between new hires. Um, there was plenty of times where uh, a barista that worked for two years was making the same rate that a barista that was just, you know, working two months. Um, and so, you know, we, of course, you know, 
found out these things and that brought, you know, a lot of grievances up. Um, and so, you know, the company had tried to like, you know, brush it off, tried to like, you know, like, oh, well, you know, if you worked over this certain time, we'll give you like, you know, like, you know, maybe like a 1% raise or something like that. But this is always across like, like a year, like they always push things off to the end. Um, and then the pandemic came around and, you know, the, working in customer service during this time, if, you know, as anybody who has, uh, I sure would agree, was one of the hardest times to work. Um, not just because of people just being upset and, you know, us, of course, being upset about everything happening, but also just the health act aspect of it all. Um, you know, I, when, when the pandemic first hit at my store, we are, so we're a cafe only. Um, there was a few drive throughs that were open, drive through only. Um, so we were closed down for a month and then we were asked to open back up again. Um, and we had, we were given a, uh, you know, a COVID catastrophe pay of three extra dollars an hour to simply come to work, work with all this extra labor um, so that we could, uh, you know, properly social distance from each other. We had only door service, so no one was allowed in. You know, for three months this was going on with the company being like, you know, we're going to take care of you. Like, you don't have to worry about a thing. But, you know, all with this in the back of the mind of like, there's something that's going to give. And if, if, you know, after working for nine years at Starbucks, I knew there's something that's going to give because I like to toot a lot of things saying like, you know, we're here for you, but then something ends up being taken away. Yeah. Um, three month mark, we, uh, we were told, we were given this memo that big changes are happening. We were no longer getting our pandemic pay, even despite the pandemic first happening, still happening. Like, and you know, it's obviously still happening. Um, so we're no longer getting that three extra dollars an hour to work. Our labor was getting cut in half. Um, we were actually allowing people to come into the store, despite there not being any sort of incentive to work, except they were giving us three options. One of them being you could sever your employment, um, you know, take a check and leave. You could stay employed for part time um, with a lower rate and possibly not as many hours, which there wasn't. Um, and still just have to work through it, or there was a leave of absence, which most people did, were not able to get. Um, so that one was basically not even there, because we would all would want to take the LOA, because I worked downtown, middle of downtown, nothing was happening. Like, we didn't even know why we opened the in the first place, because it wasn't our decision, that's for sure. Um, and so we're like, well, why don't we all just take a LOA, maybe like in a month, things will open up back up a little bit. Um, and we were all told, like, what? no, you can't take LOA. The store has to stay open. Hmm. And we're like, well, so you're going to basically terminate half our staff. The rest of us are going to go back to poverty wages, working in a much more dangerous environment because that was before um, the city nor any of the companies required masks. Um, so we were basically kind of given this ultimatum of, like, you either don't have a job or you can keep a job in this uncertain environment. Um, but, you know, essentially we have chosen profits over your health and safety. Um, and so at that point, I think there was like the real eye opener for us of being like, we are in, the, in a time of great turmoil and where health was really at this, like the focal point of everyone. We were seen as just profit makers um than just people as partners as starbucks likes to call us um so you know like we obviously knew that all the starbucks leaders even like you know our dm and higher they were not on the floor like we were like you know they're you know blissfully having zoom meetings being you know in their, their living room while i was over here talking to you know this guy who just doesn't you know care doesn't believe in the you know masking or just doesn't you know just supposed to you know, just simply be like you know there, people were back and forth it was very it was very chaotic and it was very stressful um so at that point we were you know very upset about that and so we decided that hey you know maybe we should think about unionizing but again we this was before buffalo um had come out doing the the first the, the real first push mm -hmm. um but it was definitely i think you know it was on our minds and i think it was definitely on a lot of other stores minds of something where like, you know, this would be a perfect time to unionize because we feel not represented. We feel at the whim of our employer. Um, and so really after following suit with that, um, it has become more of just like, I'm mad that you didn't give me catastrophe pay and you 
treated me as just a profit maker. But it be became more of a, um, you know, like, we're doing this for us. We're doing this for the person I work with every day. And I, like, love to death. And, you know, I love to work with. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, everyone likes to say is that, like, well, you know, you worked for Starbucks for nine years. Why don't you just quit? I'm just like, well, you know, even despite me unionizing and even despite all the complaints I could have about a job, which anybody has, I'm like, I like my job. I really do. Like, I'm a supervisor. I like running the, I like running the floor. I like making drinks. I love just, you know, the flow of everything. And I like coaching my partners to make them better, like, work, not just workers, but just better people in general. Um, and you know, I'm constantly learning as well. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to have in my life. And that's why I do continue to stay, despite all these setbacks and all these, like, turmoils and whatnot going on. Uh, plus, I'm a big believer in just fixing things that need to be fixed, but that, you know, leaders don't want to recognize need to be fixed. And so I think unionizing was really the, the calling that we needed, the, the real push of being perhaps like, no, we can make our situation better by taking it into our own hands, by lifting ourselves up and meeting our employer and actually bargaining with them um, for our rights and just to advocate for ourselves, truly. Yeah, yeah, the collective bargaining is a whole uh, a science about it that, that mm -hmm. really um, moves a body of workers forward beyond what a lot of folks don't understand if they're not ever been part of that process. Uh, so I really appreciate your effort. How how is the relationship between the two stores? How are you guys working with the two stores that are are actually organizing right now? And how, how it, it, and is that a, a a good functioning relationship or is it a strain? You, you mean with uh, Westerville? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've I've met with Gabe. Um, he's really great. Um, I've talked with Flynn a little bit. Uh, mostly, uh, we we now are linked through um, a few group chats of just kind of like looking for any sort of support, allyship and whatnot uh, with other un local unions. So I met with him via Zoom um, a while ago whenever he, uh, his store first filed mm -hmm. just to kind of, you know, you know, cause he wanted to know what to expect. And I was like, hey, this is what, you know, I've experienced. Um, we have the same, we're in the same region. We don't have the same district manager. Mm -hmm. um, so I could only really give him so much like details of like, hey, when Sarah comes in, you know, this is what you can expect from her as the regional um, and how to best protect himself and also his workers and also prep them for any sort of retaliation, any sort of like anxiety of getting, you know, one-on-ones, but not, or even just two-on-ones where they'd have a, a district manager and the regional, or maybe even this, uh, um, the store manager take someone aside and be like, oh, let's talk for a bit. Um, and just really put the pressure on them um, and just how like, you know, what I found what really worked for my store was that we have uh, what we call the rapid response group. And so it's a it's this huge network of um, supporters and other local union members that have basically volunteered to like, like voluntarily like added themselves to this group to whenever I said like, hey, you know, we're getting we're um, we're experiencing some infiltration, um, you know, like we think we could really just use some like support and just some presence of uh, like for union people to kind of combat this. Um, and so they would just come in, they would come in like in these giant groups and they do, you know, they'd say like, hey, you know, like be super energetic, like, you know, congratulations about filing, um, you know, like, hey, here's the thing, I'm in a union, this is why I like about it. Um, just to even just kind of like put that kind of presence in, in the environment to kind of like help us get less anxious about the infiltration, um, but also gives a really good talking points um, for our baristas and whatnot to feel comfortable talking to someone else who is, you know, they never knew about unions before, who could learn something new from someone else. Um, but then also just kind of like keep them, mostly just keep us busy on the floor so that we were not able to be pulled off because not of business. Able, not able to talk, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. The uh, the benefit of organizing is 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 clear to me. Mm. Um, may not be to others, but it is to me. But I I do wish to for you to share a little bit more on the the 
how can we support you? How can people that, and I, I was at the Central High Workers Center um, uh, May Day and you guys put mm -hmm. out some ideas there, but um, what, what are some like, you know, going in and saying uh, workers' rights, you know, you order your order is under the name of workers' rights or organizing mm -hmm. or, or was something like that. So can you describe a little bit of how you're sort of wanting some of the, the customers of Starbucks? I don't go to Starbucks too much, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the customers of Starbucks, what what about, um, how can they support your, your effort right now? Um, I really think just even just being transparent about, you know, if you're like a supporter of union rights and whatnot, um, is to give any sort of direct feedback to uh, either the store manager or the district manager. Um, so like, you know, if you, uh, for instance, would come to my store, say like, hey, I had a really great conversation with Damon, um, you know, like, you know, even just like naming people saying like, this person's really great, you know, it's, you know, kind of like, especially if someone's, you know, if I was saying like, hey, I'm really fearing for my job, kind of thing, uh, you know, it's going to look really suspicious if they fire someone who's getting a lot of really good reviews, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but even just saying like, hey, like, I really like the store. Like, yeah, I even had someone say, um, like, oh, I actually came to the store because they're unionizing. And I think that's really cool. Um, I like, you know, if you've ever, if anybody's ever seen my store, it's, it's, it's very hidden. And so we had never really experienced so much like love bombs from people because they didn't even know where we were until the news took like a big front of it and they're like oh i didn't even know there's a starbucks there um so for someone to come in and saying like i came to this store specifically because i found that it was unionizing and i think you know like definitely workers rate is really important you know i look you know like we're watching to see how starbucks is um reacting to this mm -hmm. um kind of stuff like that just kind of like putting out to the company that there's a large customer base that is very pro union, very much pro partners, and just saying like, hey, you should listen to them. Um, you know, like these are really great workers that um, really deserve your time, um, and uh, you know, like you should hear them out for stuff. And if you know, if there's any sort of grievance of even just saying like, oh, you know, like, well, we've been experiencing a lot of labor cuts and whatnot, saying like, oh, well, you know, they, they seem really busy. Maybe you should give them some more labor. Um, it seems really, you know, like, cause you know, when we first um, filed, we experienced like, significant labor cuts, despite after filing, getting three times more business, mm -hmm. um, didn't quite add up right. Um, but also my, um, there's another store really close to us that um, gets about the same, not the same clientele, but the same kind of uh, business where locals and whatnot, they're only cafe. Um, so they're our direct, like, com like friendly competitor in the district. Um, and so when I talked to them, uh, they said, no, we never, we haven't been experiencing labor cuts at all. And I was like, interesting, interesting, because you have pretty much the same downtown um, business I have, but suddenly we're told that we're just not making labor because we're not making enough profits i'm like well i know that's not true because we're making plenty of profits now yeah. um so i've told people that while it was happening where they're like oh it's like a little bit of a skeleton crew i'm like well you know they cut down our labor so they said you know that we just didn't make enough but you know it seems really silly so you know just kind of like telling people like this is how the company's reacting to it and so if they also bring that up saying that like there's a lot of people you know the the staff was doing the best they could um but, you know, you should really invest in them and stuff like that. And just kind of calling them out on everything that they do yeah. okay. is, uh, I think, more helpful than just coming in and just saying uh, union knows, which is also still nice just to kind of show that, especially whenever people get really excited about it and whatnot, uh, it, you know, kind of announces it. And that's really great. But more of like, I think, supportive stuff going along is the customers talking to uh, the company or like, you know, my, like the upper management and stuff in the area directly uh, through like customer feedback and whatnot. Thank you. So Anthony, I'm going to bring you in a little bit now too. So Damon, Anthony, you, you guys sort of represent different, different structure. One, uh, Starbucks would be more re uh, regulated by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, Anthony, we in Ohio State, probably based, would probably be related more with CERB, which is a, a state employee relations board, which is a different structure, but same kind of regulation of making sure uh, health, safety, compensation, worker rights, all that stuff is in place. Um, who, 
within the labor movement has been most supportive of you guys? Which which worker organization? What what um, structures have been most supportive of you guys? Damon first, uh, Anthony maybe. Uh, I'd say well, my uh, our neighbors right down the street from us is the uh, the teachers union. Um, so they have just been a hop and a skip across the street, really, um, and they have made tremendous amounts of time simply to come over and show their support like even spending hours in the cafe just you know making sure that any sort of infiltration was not happening um but also you know um really helping like even outside of work to try and like you know like just help with mentorship or just even getting involved with other things um the dsa um is also super super involved with trying to get as much um publicity and stuff for us out and just um you know, boistering uh, the mutual aid that we had to start, which was technically started by Liam the, uh, from the um, the workers' union as well. Um, when we told them, like, when we had our labor cuts, um, that, like, oh, hey, you know, like, we have some of our partners that are um, suffering financially from the labor cuts, so maybe we can get, like, a GoFundMe started. So she made one for us, and so they start, like, you know, they started, like, bumping it up and then really helping out with the DSA and everyone in the group chat started sharing it around. Um, so we were able to support our partners during that, you know, very like the heavy retaliation time. Um, so they have been just truly godsend. Well, true to the really godsend, just uh, um, just being so supportive. Anytime we had any questions, any sort of just like, hey, I'm feeling like, you know, really stressed out today. Uh, you know, just words of wisdom, truly saying like, you know, like this is a really hard part of the unionizing process, but it's like you guys, you can keep strong, just keep strong together. Like, you know, you have the friends in the community um, and your friends in us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Uh, Anthony, do you have any input on that at, at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your question was about which uh, labor organizations have been most supportive um, in or our work, case. Or worker rights or yeah. Any, anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Um, I would probably say in our case, um, the Worker Center here in Columbus has probably been the most supportive due to the fact that um, you know, the, the Workers' Center's mission is to support low-wage workers in all areas of the community. Um, we are low-wage workers. We are dealing with um, a workplace area with, with no precedent, like you mentioned, that would have to go to um, the state first before it could become an official union. Um, so <clears throat> the Workers' Center was able to provide a lot of that important context, I think, initially, and a lot of the important context and just general advice on how we should organize um, given our position and, and more understanding about how the union election process works and like like basically like helping us understand that you, you're in a, a position where there's like, you know, 10,000 student workers at Ohio State. You know, this isn't a, a Starbucks store with 15 employees. You know, we're up against something much different. Um, so. I think, yeah, the Worker Center helped set up a lot of context for that. And I would also say um, just generally other student organizations at Ohio State, um, it was really important to see solidarity from Black student associations, from climate change organizations, from um, Students for Justice in Palestine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, or different organizations were, you know, their purpose as an organization may not be to necessarily just advocate for progressive policies or labor rights, but you know, understanding that um, there's so, been very much an intersection between these issues as we talk about uh, race and labor, as we talk about gender and labor. Um, something I didn't mention um, in my initial um, presentation and that I actually would like to mention right now um, is that we also held an educational event in March um, with some OSU faculty and students um, where we basically, we talked about the intersections of uh, labor and race and gender, capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, and patriarchy. Um, and it was, um, you know, these might sound like, um, you know, academic terms when, when we first put them out there, but I think creating a space where, where students from different backgrounds can come together and talk about how they are maybe experiencing a different kind of oppression under labor where you know if you're a black woman you have to go to work and, and worry about being called unprofessional because 
of the way that you wear your hair. You know, that we were having those kind of conversations too, which I think is really, really important, especially among young people who are going out and, and becoming professionals maybe for the first time in their lives to understand that, yeah, like it's so important to have conversations about how much we're getting paid and what kind of benefits we're getting at work and, and what are the rights we have in the workplace. But we also have to extend this into a broader conversation about how we're impacted by, by labor overall as, as people, as human beings. I um, mean, I think that we definitely want to continue that. And we also want to make that space more available, not just to, not to just students and not just to, you know, academics and um, professors and faculty, but you know, also to the people who sweep the floors late at night after us, you know, workers go home. Like we want to get the janitors involved. We want to get the communications workers at Ohio State, Mark, involved um, in these discussions too. So, you know, it's, it's not just student workers that are being, um, you know, oppressed by Ohio State's influence and clout and wealth and power. Um, it's workers all over the city of Columbus. We know that these that the institution and the city have a very deep uh, financial relationship together. So um, I think, you know, it's important to um, that unions and workers organizations across Columbus um, support um, Ohio State workers as, as they continue to fight for 15 and for, for more benefits. Um, last but not least, I'll also mention that towards the very end of the semester, um, he hasn't gone public with his support yet because I think he wants to wait for like an important strategic time, right? Like maybe that vote in the Senate in September, but um, Ohio State um, basketball athlete, uh, Seth Towns actually is, is in our campaign. I don't know if any of you have ever seen him on the court. He's, he's been injured for a while, but he's um, a very uh, left-wing guy, um, a very, very good man, very, very um, educated. And we're very happy to have his support. And so we're also looking to get support in the future from other athletes, you know, either on Ohio State's basketball team or the football team. Um, you know, the, these people that Ohio State loves to make into celebrities, we would love to see them speaking out against what's happening at the university. Yeah, now too. that they so, got NIL, yeah. now that they got NIL, they, they may have some extra money too, huh? So Yeah, I yeah. We talked we <laughs> talked about that with Seth a lot about the potential for athletes now to to, you know worry about less with their their name image and likeness yeah yeah well hey thank you damon and anthony i know damon you may need to get going but stay as long as you want to anthony you say you're going to stay with us mimi you had a question that you may wanted to bring up now i think it uh it's sort of getting close to that and again yeah. i just want to say damon anthony you guys and your collective leadership um is bringing a new face to what labor organizing will be uh, in the future. And I, I just thank you so much for uh, attempting to do the the impossible. But guess what? Impossible is not impossible. Guess what? Yeah. It, can be, it, it, it will happen. It will happen. Just let you just keep keep that. As my dad used to say, keep the nose to the grindstone. But <laughs> <laughs> um, Mimi, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um... First, I want to say that I am a big fan, Damon and Anthony, of what you guys have been up to. Um, and I wanted to tell you really quick uh, where I'm coming from with this question, with the comment I wanted to make, which is I grew up in a very strongly pro-union household. Um, my first job was a union job in 1967. Eventually, I, became, I went to work for Ohio State. Um, and got elected to the leadership of the union there. And then I went to New York and got professional training and became a field organizer for the National Hospital Union and worked for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so I've seen a lot. Um, and I just got to say, I can't believe I lived long enough to see Starbucks getting organized. <laughs> Thank you so much. The only thing that... <laughs> And then, then Amazon gets on the train. Oh, I'm going, yeah. what is happening here? I Seriously, I really want people who sort of follow labor to understand that what's going on right now is earth-shaking, phenomenal, unprecedented, and presents an opportunity that people who want peace and justice have not had in my lifetime. Yes. Lay, organized labor has always been the steel spine of the movements for peace and justice. And That's right. I mean, we want organization for the sake of the workers primarily but this is another thing this is another way that that organizing manifests 
And um, it's so important that this is happening now, not just for the folks in every single shop that's getting organized, but for all of us. And, and then I have a question quickly. What are you guys doing on um, June 24th? Because, <laughs> because we wanted to have a workshop. <laughs> yes, we wanted to have a workshop on labor organizing at ConFest, and I've been trying to reach various people with no luck, um, and we need to put the program guide together. You could reach me at mimi.morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, at ConFest.com. I would love it, or if somebody wants to give me your phone numbers at some point, that would be groovy, because um, we really would like to do this, and, and we need to put the schedule together now. Yeah, that's going to be so much fun. I think that'd be super great. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm getting really tired of running into people who say, what's this AFL-CIO thing I keep hearing about? Ah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Got to uh, fix this. Thank, thank you, Mimi. And yeah, you're, you, you, you and Mike, you, you guys, you, uh, you, you're just understating all the work that you've done in the past. So uh, can't oh. even, can't even go through the whole paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of what you guys have done. So thank you. For joining tonight um i see scott's hand i don't see who scott is but um you do you have a question scott i don't know which scott scott is scott so. um so my name is scott kaplan i'm a faculty member at ohio state university at the marion campus and i am the faculty member who is attempting to unionize the ohio state faculty through ask me council eight fantastic and um so we filed our petition with uh, CERB and we are scheduled at some point in the very near future to, we already had our telephone conference and we're trying to get our um, hearing to see if they will allow us to be represented or recognized as an independent bargaining unit. And for anybody that is interested in lending support to this endeavor, which is kind of, as I'm seeing at the tip of the spear for OSU faculty organizing, please contact AFSCME Council 8. Council 8. Yes, thank you, Scott. And uh, Marion, huh? All right. Thank you, Scott. Um, Damon, Anthony, and now Scott. Uh, we got we got some organizing going on. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and let's let's advance and move forward and uh, be be unified. And uh, hopefully the free press uh, will be able to be a location where you could write articles because we are we are media. We are a media center. We are a people's media center. We're an activist people's media center. And we really would encourage all y'all to write about your campaign so that you can get that word out to the millions of people that read our paper. Oh, well, not millions, but <laughs> <laughs> we hope one day. Um, but thank you again for all that you guys have done. And um, I don't know if we have any more comments and if you guys want to say any last words before you take off. I know, Damon, you were... Uh, John wanted to make sure you got off because you were young and you need to get going. So <laughs> I, I, I have my other job to, to work. So yeah, I'm in my, my uniform right now. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So if you got to get going, please, please thank you. Th just know, thank you for the work you're doing and, and definitely reach out to us if you ever are at a point that you need uh, outside uh agitators <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate you guys so much thank you so much for your support it's yes. truly inspiring it really is all right damon thank you so much for all thank your you and, and be safe out there and i'll come to i will come to starbucks downtown just to help <laughs> <you>. <laughs> just come say hi you can just get a, a union yes water it's all good hey, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll do that i'll do that all right <laughs> thank you so much guys great all to right. meet everyone thanks thank you yeah. right. take care damon we'll see you soon See you soon. All right. So um, I, we were going to, hey, Stephen, you, you jumped out right there. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> I see you right there. Um, we were going to have a little bit of update on the Amazon, but just, I don't know if anybody is on that's doing some local organizing. We were trying to get some of them. I don't know if John, did you want to maybe, John Latsker, want to talk a little bit about that aspect? Um, or not, but if if not, um, no, Amazon has organized a few places, or workers of Amazon have organized in a few places. Um, but 
notoriously the corporate the corporate culture is going to react and we know Starbucks and Amazon are going to react to these movements and we have to be ready for that counter reaction uh, because we're going to have folks that may lose their jobs we may have folks that are going to be um, uh, distressed in a lot of dis different ways and we have to support them somehow some way one way that the the free press can do is to continue to look in and write about explore research and do those kind of political things that that we are good at doing so um, if we start just at least at the very beginning start relationship building and I think that's what we started doing tonight is start building a relationship with some of the organizers and um, and Anthony you're still on so I don't know if you have other points of where some support may be able to come forward um, so, but that's it. I just want you to know that yeah the corps are going to come at us they're going to come at us they always do even even once we get a union they don't want you and I that's sort of where I want to get to I'm, I'm CWA 4502 right here right wherever, right here um, we're city employees we are 45 or 4200 employees of the city of Columbus and we are um, um, we are the supervisors professional managers and stuff but all the unions city council voted to give us quote unquote hero pay I didn't like the term frontline worker pay through the COVID the mayor held it up we had to go and do direct negotiation this is where this collective bargaining stuff comes into play it's taken us a year since city council said yeah you're going to get frontline pay a thousand dollars it's a p poultry money poultry for what we had to go through because we were front line I mean during the whole COVID we were on site dealing with people etc this this city leadership that says they're labor friendly it's taken a year for us to even get to now they're saying we're gonna get paid our thousand uh, uh, frontline money but it took negotiations collective bargaining it took that power that collective power of all our unions there was five six different local locals uh, unions that are in the city of Columbus that uh, came straight to the mayor and said we're negotiating with you because this is we're reopening our bargaining uh, contracts and we are going to negotiate this and the only issue is frontline money um, we finally got that and we also got 500 for uh, they used to call it an incentive now it's a reward for getting a COVID vaccination so those are things that the city council voted for this a long time ago and it took us almost a year after that to get this so it's the importance of having a union is what I'm trying to say there's an importance to having an organized voice at work and my mother always said when I was growing up don't ever go work without a union she said that she she said don't ever go to work without a union or you will get fried you'll be left out negotiating on your own and you're going to get fried because the corporation has lots of people that they're going to come at you okay so um that's just one thing i wanted to do with an update uh one other great conference that i don't know if any other folks have heard about but labor notes is a fantastic they're going to come up we finally i finally got my vice president to go he's going to go um to labor notes up to chicago in in at the uh in june june it's in june this year but uh, we have gone several times it is a great labor friendly organizer activist uh, a coalition of, of of folks that if you ever want to go to a conference this is where you need to go you'll learn much about what the labor movement is what our activists labor activists are uh, how community and labor overlap and play together I mean it's very important that community organizing community organizing and labor organizing are seen as one one part of the struggle um, and yeah Anthony began to talk about the my eyes sort of glaze over when people start talking intersectionality but I understand the concept but how people that are in struggle how people that are are seeking justice uh, that are facing repression and oppression and suppression 
they need each other to work together, right? So um, I just wanted to say that Labor Notes and City of Columbus uh, Union, I just wanted to do that quick update. Uh, we're at a point now, it's 8.06. Um, do anybody have any final comments that they want to say? But we got Bill uh, with the uh, Seaboard um, uh, Bill of Rights, Columbus uh, Bill of Rights folks. I want to talk a little bit about the Charter Review Commission that's coming up. They're struggling uh, to get a voice in this process, and um, it, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, but I just want us to sort of do a little conversation. But I want to close this down first uh, it's to say that happy International Workers' Day. We are here. We're moving forward. Unions, union first, workers always, forward ever, backward never. Um, and I don't know if Jess got on either, but Jess was going to maybe talk about the action as well today um, downtown. But um, I don't know how many people went down there, uh, but it was a very sizable number of folks. And that went on across the country today um, about uh, health care access uh, for women. Um, that's another whole kettle of wax that we're going to be working at. Yeah, I see no jit. Okay. Um, so anybody have any final words about worker rights and, and, and that, that, that celebration that we've had today? Um, I know we should probably sing the International. Does it, uh, Mimi, can you uh, sing us in? Um, Mm. <laughs> hey Jonathan, how you doing? I see you jumping up on us. Yeah, how you doing, John? How you doing, yeah, John? You're gonna say you you're gonna sing us the uh, international. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I do that. I'm gonna follow your lead though. <laughs> uh, yes, it it. But the one I really like is Marseille. Um, the the French the French uh, sound that is so exciting. I've been going over to France late last few May days, and that's been sort of fun to see that. I've been to uh, Japan, uh, uh, Lisbon, and um, or uh, Portugal, and to France's uh, May Days in the last uh, eight years. So I'm starting to get a little bit more international in my understanding of what what May Day. And so I'm sort of embarrassed by Columbus, Ohio, and the United States, who actually instigated, organized the first Labor Day called May Day. Um, and now we don't really celebrate it too much. Uh, so I'm, I'm calling for us to maybe rethink how we can regroup and push that that day forward as, as a method. So um, thank you for everyone that's jumped on that. And we're going to move now to um, Bill. Are you ready to move forward with the discussion on the uh, Charter Review Commission? Yes. Joe, Joe's on. And, and I know Jonathan's been following. John, John here too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I, I'll try not to take much of your time because uh, um, we'll, we've uh, Joe uh, Joe Motel and John, Jonathan Beard and I have organized a, a Zoom meeting uh, on Thursday, May twenty sixth at seven p.m. Uh, where you can come and we can have more time because it does take time to know what the hell's going on here. And I can't really do it justice here tonight. So, but uh, let me, while I'm, I'm doing that, while I'm going to talk, I'll just share my screen briefly about some notes that I wrote uh, about what they're trying to do with initiative and referendum. And of course, other things. And I wrote it and will give Will uh, Perkins credit for making it pretty here. So hopefully you can see that here. Uh, so, and let me, before I say just a couple words in the chat, um, I'll put my uh, email address so that uh, email me there at, the, uh, you know, wmlines at gmail.com if you would like the link for the Zoom meeting. And I'm also going to ask Connie Hammond to put it in her peace newsletter too. So just real quick, the city, this is like our constitution. We know there's a lot going on statewide that's bad, countrywide that's bad, and internationally. But where, and sure, we should be paying attention and, and, and doing what we can for those things, but where we can have the most effect on policy is where we live locally. And so this is our chance to really uh, make a voice and 
democracy where we live. And, and these things directly affect us uh, here. So the, the city last had a charter co uh, view commission in 2014, and they made some bad, a few bad recommendations. Then they got on the ballot and, and uh, you know, so now not only we want to react to, there's been seven meetings and then finally they had a public hearing. And all those seven meetings have been city officials saying what they want to be changed on the charter. So how democratic is that? You know, how much do they really want to hear from the public? And so, and they were going to limit our testimonies to three minutes. So I wrote them and said, this is crazy. So they did, but, and they only gave notice on Friday and the hearing was last Tuesday, this past Tuesday. So you can see what's going on here. So they plan on having, uh, they have a meeting this Wednesday um, at uh, three o'clock, what their regular meeting. And so we're interested to find out uh, the comments that uh, Joe, myself, Carolyn Harding, Sandy Bozenius testified, and then I know uh, John Beard sent in testimony, and we've all sent in, and other other people did. So we uh, they they were just going to have one more meeting after the proposal went to City Council, <laughs> and so I'm like, oh my God. So. Uh, whatever it, you know, it will be. They they said they're going to have one more meeting, but we don't know when it will be yet. So we're watching this meeting, and but this will be your chance to learn more about what you can do. So these notes here, like I said, are just about. Uh, we're going to have this at, at Comfest too, but you can s just read briefly about initiative and referendum recommendations. But what they're dealing with is they've made recommendations regarding the open meetings law which is bad because they want to give control of all that to, for decision-making to city council. And that means they can close more meetings to the public and do more under back, back room deals. So there's other things, and then they're going to have other things more. So this is not our chance to not only push back from what they're doing and let these commissioners, because they don't really know what's going on. They were appointed into this thing here. But to also say what we want in the chart. So anything, uh, so anyhow, please email me about that. I'll get uh, Connie to uh, make an announcement to that. And uh, if uh, Joe and John uh, want to say any few words, like I said, I don't want to go through this whole thing here because we'll go through and more things. And, and let me just say what you can do. Uh, is you can not only let people know what's going on, you can get educated to show up to the uh, our Zoom session Thursday, May 26th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can uh, testify if you want in person or virtually whenever the next hearing is, and we'll let you know if you want to uh, email me. And then also, even if you don't want to speak, you can send in uh, you know, what you want in the charter and what you don't want in the charter. So this is something that uh, it's, I knew that they were going to use issue seven from last November to uh, further try to squash all citizen initiatives. And why is this so important? Because it's not just Columbus Community Bill of Rights has been kept off the ballot. Jonathan Beard also has, uh, initiative has been kept off the ballot. He and Joe are working on a rent control initiative. This is our, our chance to legis be co-legislators that the uh, was in our uh, constitution since 1912 when the city officials aren't acting in the public interest. It's already hard. They're trying to make it harder. So uh, if Joe and John want to say any last words, that's all I've got. So please email me and uh, educate, find out, and let's let's try to stop this, the crap they're trying to do. Yeah, Bill, I just want to thank you for um, keeping an eye on it and letting people know what's going on. Because it is, again, the city of Columbus being absolutely undemocratic, consolidating power and taking away from people. Um, so I appreciate you letting us know what's going on so we had an opportunity to um, provide our input. Um, you know, this is just more of the same, kind of a, a fake citizens commission. Okay, thanks, Joe. Yeah, and I and also, I just like All to the say, usual people. Trudy yeah. Bartley chairs it, and you know, she's been an insider for decades. Yeah, and they're, they're just, the city is just spoon-feeding yeah. them what the city wants in the charter. You know, it's, it's, it's really sickening when you watch it. Yeah. It is. It is. It's it's pretty much like the the chart the chart the compensation uh, 
commission and setting the salaries for our elected officials, 40% for the for the city council president and 14% for the mayor and cost of living adjustments. I mean, it, it's a joke. And the way they put these commissions together and who they choose for it, bunch of hand-picked lackeys, it's it's pretty pathetic. This charter review thing too, people, you can, you can request anything you want, make a recommendation of anything in the city charter, period. And I I started off with a list of about five different things on top of the two major issues that we're we're dealing with right now, uh, and I'm going to address some more. Uh, in 2014, I I recall going to the public hearing, and out of the four things that I suggested, I actually got one to be put on the ballot because some of you may remember back in the day the petitions used to read that if you signed a petition for a candidate. You had to vote for them. I mean, in so many, that's what it said. And I said, this is the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen in my life. And I told the commissioners that it's like, are you going to follow these people to the polls and then ask them, make sure that they voted for the person that they signed the petition on? I mean, it, and so they actually took it out of, out of the charter. And I was like, my God, they do have a little bit of sense anyways. So uh, there, I guess there's a slim possibility of getting them to, to change some things. Getting so, some. Yeah. 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 So, man, yeah, they're just depending on, on people not paying attention to this. They've been flying this under the radar. Like I said, seven uh, meetings and then they've got another one. So that's why we're trying to say find out, get involved. And, and you know, if and you can listen to our recommendations uh, on uh, the uh, 26th and uh if you like those, you can write to them and say, look, I want this and I don't want this. So and you can come up with your own if you think about it as well. You can, you know, so, yeah, exactly what Joe said. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Bill and Jonathan and Joe. Joe, the mayor modal uh, is uh, anticipating some work uh, from folks. If they, they want to join in, uh, please join Mayor Motul uh, in his effort. Um, Pat Morita wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, 434 that's going on downtown. Uh, downtown. So, uh, Pat, do you want to talk a little bit? Thanks, Bill, and and we'll give you more time next next time as well. Um, to be okay. Clear. I think after the 26, you'll have a little bit more uh, uh, to yes. tell us about some of ground. Yes, thanks, also. Mark. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. So, Pat, Pat Morita, are you available? Ready? Yeah. Can you hear me? And I guess you can yes. see me, right? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. It's always good seeing Pat Morita. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, uh, thank you. This has been a very interesting program. Thanks to everybody that, that appeared on this. Um, so, yeah, Ohio House Bill 434, it would create a new Ohio entity, and they're calling themselves the Ohio Nuclear Development Authority, and they would do research and development on new nuclear reactors. Uh, it would spend an unspecified amount of taxpayer money, would be very secretive the way it's set up, uh, even an authority. We don't even know the rights of an authority under Ohio law. It's kind of hard to figure that out. Huh. Uh, the bill's only four pages long and, I mean, <laughs> 14 pages long, and eight of those pages describe a convoluted way that they will get their uh, people on their board of directors. So even the governor cannot choose who is on this on this board. But anyway, um, there is a petition and I'm gonna put it online. I'm gonna put it in the chat now. You can go and click on this petition and just sign that, that you uh, will go to your state senator because it's already passed the house, like, uh, like 75 to 18. We really have to stop this bill. Uh, click on this link and just sign this petition uh, and it will go to your state senator because it has not yet been heard in the Senate. And then I want to say last that the Green Party, they're having a press conference uh, on the bill this next Wednesday, May 18th. It's going to be at noon at the State House, right in front there by the McKinley statue. And um, Terry Lodge, attorney from Toledo, and I will be the speakers. So right. I'm putting that in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Pat, I, I will be there in spirit. I have a, a mandatory all staff meeting at that point. I, I, I will be there in spirit. Uh, thank you for doing the work <coughs> you're doing on that. 
and keeping uh, downtown very uh, general assembly very very at least keeping uh, tabs on them is very hard I know emotionally and uh, um, physically uh, getting into the building is hard and just being there listening to the toxic behavior and thinking that's on majority uh, minds down there it, it's just it, it, it's we don't know where Ohio is heading but we I don't like the direction it's going I, 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 I'll tell you that right now um, it was dangerous too with the COVID because you no know, they weren't wearing masks and we were all afraid to go down and testify yeah well you were you were made to go down to testify it wasn't that they were yeah they had some hybrid reality but most of it they said no you had to come down to testify if you're going to say anything come down to us and they were saying why 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 you know breathing all their stuff out and in there yeah it was crazy um thank you pat and and keep keep up the work and keep telling telling us what's going on down there please uh mary mary jane has said that there will not be a ballot uh, initiative on uh, in the November's uh, uh, election uh, uh, possibility. Do you want to talk why that didn't happen or, or is there some strategy on that? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, you know, so I write a column that was just published yesterday, in fact, uh, the My Mary Jane's Guide. Uh, and so um, I cover really what's going on in cannabis in Ohio and nationally. So that I, like I said, but people who read it, if you're an activist in the movement, I want to make our activists the smartest people they possibly can be. And that's the purpose of what I do. Um, so the, there's a procedure, I don't know, try to go a little background here. There's a procedure uh, in the um, Ohio constitution that allows for what they're called initiated statutes. In other words, you know, you usually the idea is to collect a bunch of signatures, put it on the ballot, and it becomes a constitutional amendment. But in this particular case, you catch a collect a bunch of signatures, and you can put it before the General Assembly. Okay, so this campaign that they, they got uh, kind of thwarted during the, the during the COVID, but this past fall they collected their sufficient signatures. This was about 135,000. Let's leave it around numbers. Uh, they turned them into the um, Secretary of State's office on December 20th. Uh, on January 3rd, the Secretary of State said, you don't have enough. They went out and collected about 29,000 more, and then, uh, which qualified them for about, surpassed the, 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 the benchmark by about 3,000 signatures. And so the Secretary of State forwarded to the General Assembly as uh, he is charged to, uh, charged to do in the Ohio Constitution. Well, in the meantime, the Republicans in the House and Senate uh, took a look at the timing of this, and they kind of raised some red flags and said, well, you didn't get all your signatures in before, uh, in time to start, because I think the first session of General Assembly was supposed to be January 3rd. They didn't get all their signatures collected and validated until January 10th. And therefore, you know, they, that makes it invalid. Yeah. And so the campaign filed a lawsuit against the Secretary of State and the, um, I think it was um, the President of the Senate uh, and one other person, I can't remember who that was, and said, look, we need a decision on this because these things are expensive. We got a lot of money invested, a lot of time invested. And, and, and so it just, just yesterday, the case was decided in the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. And fortunately, the settlement for this lawsuit was that they were going to kind of uphold what the Republicans in the, the legislature said about the weird timing. But they got a concession from, I think, the court, because the Secretary of State wouldn't go along with it, but he had to go along with it because it was a settlement of the lawsuit. And it said, okay, what we'll do is we'll enable you to do the process just as if you were going this year, but it would be next year. In other words, what we'll do is we'll have the Secretary of State validate your signatures, they're already validated, Put it before the General Assembly in January of 2023, and General Assembly will have four months to act on it. You know they won't. In fact, the, uh, 
uh, cop, what was it, the president of the Senate said, you know, you can just take it to the ballot. We're not interested. DeWine says, I don't believe uh, legalization of marijuana. I'm going to veto it. I'm going to think those things are probably going to stand after the first of the year, but we'll see. So the time the General Assembly now has to evaluate this initiative is from January 3rd, 2023 to March 3rd, May 3rd, I'm sorry, in 2023. And if um, the General Assembly doesn't act, They'll go collect a bunch more signatures. They'll put it on the ballot in 2023, and that's that. But you got you, the thing I think that is is consistent in all of this is, and I hate to get political. No, I'm about friends here. I can get political. Um, is that the, the Republicans are going to find any way they can to keep what they don't want off the ballot, and you know why? Because it brings out voters. And Republicans don't like voters. Okay. So, and it's a typical thing. This has happened before, before. So, we understand what happened, but that's the status of where adult use is right now. And there's bills in the, in the, in the House that some of them have been introduced. Those are going to go nowhere. Those are going to die at the end of the year. And so, that's where we're at. Thank you, Mary Jane. Um, we had a, uh, I think one other announcement, and I'm forgetting it right now. I was <laughs> I was starting to do something Pat asked me to do on DM. So I'm sorry, I got lost. Um, I appreciate everybody's um, contributions today. So we're sort of gonna. It's about 8:27, 28 now, 20 almost 8:30. So we're gonna probably move into more an informal. So uh, Stephen, we might cut the the the. Um, the recording. At